Teresa Kofi has basically unleashed her plan of, of plan for patients. And in that, there's a couple of key directives that have caused some, shall we say, interesting perspectives. And in this episode, we're going to discuss that whole plan, its implications for both the NHS, general practice, and our patients. So let's get ready as we tech enhance primary care and learning. Hello EGP learners and welcome to this episode with myself and Andy back together in the room and we're going to be talking about our plan for patients. This is a document by Teresa Kofi, our new Secretary of State for Health, and we're going to be looking at what this document means, what impact this has on general practice, the NHS and our patients as well. And you're more than welcome to jump in and join us by commenting on the stream as we talk about this. But first of all, how are you doing, Andy? Yeah, I'm not I'm not too bad. Thanks, Gandhi. Uh, really interesting. Uh, been a lot of change over the past few weeks, hasn't there? New mm-hmm. prime minister, uh, new monarch, uh, another new health secretary, the, the fourth in the last 12 months. Mm-hmm. Uh, and with another sort of plan, another perspective on how to uh, improve the NHS and improve patients access to services. Um, she's hit the ground running with mm-hmm. a new document that's been released, which we'll be spending some time looking at today. Uh, so obviously our plan for general practice is or our plan for patients, not our plan, it's no, Theresa Coffey and the, the government's yeah. um, plan. And yeah, as you say, it's been a little bit controversial. Um, so uh, I'm keen to dive in and start having a look really, Gandhi. Yeah, so we're going to have a look at the document itself or website because this isn't an official NHS England one. So just to be clear, this is not a contractual change. This is a Department of Health policy directive um, and it basically is pretty detailed. Let's bring it up on screen. So there we go. So you can go to the links um, and down below in the show notes that will take you to this particular page. Um, and it, it, to be honest, it's short by NHS England and the mm-hmm. Department of Health Standards. So that's the first thing. This is definitely something you can go off and read yourself if you wanted to. It will take you about 10 minutes or so to read the whole document, mm-hmm. which, as I said, is short by normal standards. Yeah, and I think, I think it's important to say at this stage, uh, it's a plan. It's not a uh, legislative change. It's not mm-hmm. contract change at this stage. Um, but I think it does give an indication of where Teresa Coffey and um, Liz Trust will be wanting to take the NHS in the next few months and and years. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really interesting. I, I like to do a, a sort of a, a, a find word analysis sometimes mm-hmm. from these documents. And the interesting thing is it's actually very much focused on general practice. Mm-hmm. Um, the the terms GP or general practice appear 20 times in this document, and just the term doctor appears five times. And as we go through, you'll see that actually there's a lot of focus on GP and access yes, to general practice. very much so. Which will come to an interesting um, part of that nomenclature a little bit later on when we get to the ABCD <laughs> terminology and stuff. But the fo- it starts off with a forward. Um, do you want to tell us about the forward, Andy? Yeah, so um, these are always interesting. Um, gives you an idea of um, where the the authors and the government want to sort of place emphasis. That they, they, I've read a lot of these in the past few mm-hmm. years. Uh, they tend to follow a similar structure, sort of acknowledge uh, people are grateful to the NHS, people are grateful for the efforts during COVID. Uh, these sorts of um, uh, the headsets use the word platitudes, but it almost feels like they they, they need to say these things um, at this point um, yep. and acknowledge them. Still. Lots of sacrifice made by people in the NHS has been a big effort. And actually, there was a lot of public appreciation for that. So maybe it does not go without saying. Um, And there's a focus in the forward really on um, uh, improving access. This is very much focused on access Mm -hmm. uh, and doesn't talk actually quite so much about other things which you might have found important in the past, like quality and other things that that, that are important, very much focused on access. Um, And there's an emphasis about about patient empowerment as well. uh, allowing people to see data from in, within the health service and you know let that drive their choices. Um, I mean that's it really. I mean really it's in the it's in the the, the meat and vegetables for for this document. I think. Mm-hmm. Um, any thoughts on the forward, Gandhi? Or as I said, it, it's a brief summary. It mentions the the George's Cross that the NHS it got. Um, you know that was given to NHS, not to individual workers, which. Would have been slightly different, I guess. Um, and we talked about that on previous episodes, anyway. Um, and it, it is very much there seems to be a focus on patients, which uh, is not a wrong thing at all. It's definitely where our focus needs to be. But we'll see why this has some implications and stuff for everybody else afterwards. 
the first section talks about patience, though, definitely. And so that's um, our plan for patience, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. And it's often worth just reflecting on how these documents are structured. So uh, probably with, I think at this stage, about A, B, C, D, D, there's two Ds. Um, yes. in this document um, and I think this has allowed sort of ministers uh, you know Liz Trust, Teresa Coffey to talk in simple terms um, about the content of the document it makes it memorable um, so you can see why they've structured in this way so uh, A, B, C, D, D what are they Gandhi? Well I think probably worth coming to that in a second <laughs> Andy okay. um, because that's more the NHS England's combination part of this so the yep. first thing it actually talks about is patients and, and the information and in, keeping them empowered and stuff yep. so this is about making uh, information available uh, in particular and there's a couple of focuses on this in terms of um patient yeah. information for access and, and things general they, practice so data. this so this bit they structure in three p's yeah. um uh, it's really interesting to see how they pull these together so we've got patients uh we'll start to scroll down we've got patients we've got prevention mm -hmm. And we've got primary care. Yes. So it's letting us know out there that this is going to be a big part of this document and this sort of strategic mm -hmm. shift. Um, talk about patients. Um, it's really talking about empowering uh, patients and informing them, essentially. So it talks about making data about performance of the NHS available to patients. Mm -hmm. So that's waiting lists um, in secondary care. Yep. And they're talking about GP appointment data in primary care, mm -hmm. essentially. And the idea behind this, they're saying, is to empower patient choice so that patients can choose which GP to register with, mm -hmm. I guess, if they have an indication of how likely they are to get an appointment at that GP practice. Lots of flaws around the data, yes. and we'll talk about that at the appropriate point, you know, and also to decide which hospital to go for with a waiting list. And they also um, imply that um, practices or hospitals can learn from each other where their data yeah. isn't as good as other places but I think part of that is really sort of peer comparison and uh, using that as a motivating yeah. factor as well as a way to learn from the good practice of others uh, from a patient perspective that, that that it all sounds very sensible I think the devil is in the detail and in the quality of the data which Definitely. we will come to at the right point uh, they then talk about prevention and really they split this into physical health mm -hmm. and mental health um, and talk about employment so in terms of physical health they're talking about um, you know a focus on uh, breast screening, they talk about a mobile breast yep. screening units. Um, in a way, that's quite a sort of a, a visible high profile thing that I think mm -hmm. will resonate with the public. They also talk about uh, blood pressure monitoring, which I think alludes to the cardiovascular risk reduction you know, work yes. that's probably already Which is place. a key driver currently in this financial year that many networks and practices are focusing on, as well as um, pharmacies, which do come into this document quite a few times as well. So the pharmacy cohort is definitely um, represented yeah and then and then they talk about uh, mental health um they talk about uh, particularly mental health in children in schools mm -hmm. and the origin of mental health problems that often yep. occur um in childhood which i think is a very sensible point to make um and then they also talk about employment which mm. um is interesting to throw in although uh, i guess we do know that people who are employed generally employ better physical uh enjoy better physical better mental health mm -hmm. possible there's a possibility that they may maybe effects rather than cause mm -hmm. um you know, it's it's definitely an association, and actually, I think where people are capable to work, we all try and you know encourage yeah. them back to work, and, and 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 normally people will want to do that. But it's interesting that that's in there, I think, mm -hmm. and is maybe speaking to a, a a conservative audience. I don't like to necessarily read too much into it. Yeah, it will we'll, resonate with we'll the audience. Come to that. So that comes into the care part that comes on <laughs> later on. Um, so there's some interesting um directives in that part that I think many people will be keen to look at yeah there's yeah there's some threads that run through so employment and employment in health that runs through mm -hmm. um, i don't know if we've lost a feed there for a second candy i'm not sure there was a glitch hopefully people are still yep i think we're still going us. but we shall see apologies <laughs> then, if it's flicked out <laughs> in and out and then it goes to primary, primary care. care and the interesting thing about this heading is it's about meeting public expectations it's not about quality it's not about performance it is meeting expectations is the heading i think so i mean it is worth acknowledging that you know, the expectation to be able to access healthcare and, and see a gp or, or suitable alternative i would add um when you need it is important mm -hmm. so and, and the public um you know, are having difficulty you know in yeah. this area uh so that's you know, it's important to acknowledge that uh, but they break it down into a few key aims and they say we will mm -hmm. so uh the expectation of everyone who needs an appointment with their practice yep. they'll get one in two weeks the word need is in there um, yes. it needn't be and sometimes when statements are made like this it's not there no. so actually need rather than want or expects is mm -hmm. actually quite 
good that that's in there. Yes. Um, so there's three words I'd focus on on that particular sentence, mainly because that's the words that the media in particular have not focused on. So as you said, there's the expectation, not the requirement. Mm -hmm. Number two is, um, as you mentioned, need for employment, and it doesn't specify who's determining that need. But more importantly, um, and, and this is the key one, it says GP practice, not GP. And a lot of the media outlets, when they've taken this message, they have seem to have omitted the word practice mm. from this. So, so they've neglected the fact that this is not about necessarily seeing an individual person in the practice, i.e. the GP. It is about the service from general practice as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, just I'm maybe getting a little bit off tangent and philosophizing here mm. a little bit, but I think we've always had a difficulty with the word. So a general practice mm. is a general practice surgery, but it's also the name of a particular type of professional that works within a surgery. Yes. And I think that that is no longer serving us very well no. uh, these days. I might say, we'll just say primary care, but primary care is so much bigger than the GP surgery. So mm -hmm. I always feel like we need a new, a new word to describe general practice. Constantly Let debated, and we're not gonna solve that today, I don't think. Suge suggestions in the, co in the comments box, uh, mm -hmm. if you have any. Um, so yeah, so uh, we want to prioritize patients uh, with most urgent needs so that they're seen same day. Mm -hmm. um, and then they're talking about including opening up uh, uh, with a million more extra appointments over the winter. Um, anything you want to do in a more forensic fashion with that sentence, Gandhi? You're right, the devil is in the detail and the word. Yeah, so, so um, I, I don't like the word seen um, yeah. because obviously we have changed the way that general practice is being offered and not necessarily everything needs to be seen in the sense of physical. And that's, yeah. I think, the connotation many people take from that wording that seen means you have to see me in the practice. That's not applicable to everybody. Definitely, there are situations where you need to have the patient in front of you. Um, there are also many situations where actually that's not the best solution. Um, and I, I've seen a lot of the rhetoric on social media about this. You know, people talking about, well, if I break my arm, I want to go see my GP about that. Well, actually, no, if you break your arm, you need to go to A&E because it's a fracture. You know, if you are having chest pain, which Therese Kofi herself has mentioned in one of her interviews, that she wants um, patients that have chest pains to be able to be seen by their GP. Again, Generally speaking, if you're concerned about cardiac chest pain, as in heart attacks and that mm. kind of stuff, going to your GP is the worst place for you to be because it delays the potential impact of care that you need. That is something that should be going to the A&E department appropriately. Yes, stratifying that has some implication for certain patients, but majority of patients in those situations, they shouldn't be going to the GP. So the word seen, I have a slight issue with. The other thing, the extra million appointments per year, so given the fact that general practice actually provides 300 million appointments yeah. plus <laughs> per year, that's less than 0.3% increase that they're suggesting over the winter period. It sounds like a massive number yeah. in the scheme of things. We do more than that in one day. So that's one extra day of general practice they're talking about. The bank yeah. holiday that we missed out, for example, making up for that yeah. effectively. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. 0 0.3 of a percent, 0.4 of a percent mm. of the total number of appointments is not necessarily going to be felt by mm. the general public, whilst it sounds like a big number. Um, the next statement is is interesting. It feels almost a little bit old-fashioned, really. So they're going to make it easier to contact your GP practice mm. by making an additional 31,000 phone lines uh, available for GP practices. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting comment, isn't it? I mean, I know we, we don't use discrete physical phone lines in yep. my building. We have a sort of soft phone solution, mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of voice over internet solution that enables us actually to activate as many phone lines as we mm -hmm. have, telephones in the building. Uh, the problem for us is having enough reception staff to pick up the phones at peak Agreed. times. And then the third problem for us is actually uh, the availability of workforce to provide the appointments for them to book into. So yeah. the reason why people can't, the phone lines are busy first thing Monday mornings because everybody rushes to call at the same time. Mm -hmm. But the reason why people can't get appointments is not because there aren't enough phone lines, you know, it's, exactly. it's because there aren't enough appointments. It's one of those standard things where it's providing an extra resource, but if you don't have the people to actually manage the resource, then it is completely useless. However, um, mm -hmm. worth noting that 31,000 lines um, in the context that it's taken, if it's talking about increasing access, that's approximately four per practice. Mm -hmm. There's about 7,000 7, pr yeah. GP practices across the whole of the UK. Um, so that is an increase in the provision. I think moving towards cloud telephony based does have clear benefits, particularly in terms of remote working and improving accessibility from the workforce as well as for patients in that sense. And there are some stratifications, but again, it doesn't solve the issue, which is the workforce part of it. Yeah, but I appreciate it's a problem for the, it's an for attempt. the public. It, it's, it's, yeah. it, it's definitely useful. And I think there are absolutely benefits that cloud telephony can have. And we've talked about that with some of our providers yeah. that we've had as well. 
um, in terms of some of the conference work we've been doing and on EGP Learning, sharing some of the really cool things you can do with particular groups and stuff. So definitely has some benefits. Love to know the detail on this one, but unfortunately not in this document. And the next point is about um, giving patients the information mm -hmm. um, by publishing data about how many appointments each GP practice provides and the waiting time for mm -hmm. those appointments to enable patient choice, um, which I think is, you know, it's a reasonable aspiration, actually. Mm -hmm. And, you know, many practices um, in the past few years have sought to close their lists because mm -hmm. they felt that they are too... Uh, too busy and they don't have the staff to provide good enough service for those patients that are already there. So yeah. they feel they can't provide service for extra patients. And it's been very difficult to do that. But I guess if patients can sort of see, you know, as they're shopping around for a new GP surgery, which practices are busy and struggling to look after those patients that they've already got, they can choose to join a less busy practice. So you can kind of see the aspiration is about using information to mm. enable efficiency within the market as people shop around for their GP practice. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a big problem with how um, comparable the data on appointments from one practice will be to another, Absolutely. given what we know about how we're currently recording this information. I don't know whether you want to talk about that now, Gandhi, is it, is it the time? Probably worth mentioning a couple of things in point. So it talks about, you know, giving you the choice and then you can potentially look at which practice you want to have your healthcare service mm -hmm. by. Important to recommend, recognize that actually, um, a lot of GP practices are still geographically based and there are implications by being registered with a GP practice that's outside of the practice area that you live in. Um, so, for example, you know, you can register with a practice that's not in your geographical area. Mm. However, that limits the availability of particular things like visiting is the yeah. key one. So if you ever need a home visit, you may not have that ability if you're registered outside of your practice area. More importantly, a lot of things, services adjunct to general practice are very much still geographically based. So things like district nursing care services, mm. primary care network services, council based services mm. that you would have access to. You won't have access to potentially if you're registered with a practice outside of your geographical area because of the bureaucracy that comes with yeah. some of this. So recognizing that whilst it does allow you the option of looking at your local practices that you are in the geographical area on, that can have an implication if you move to a practice that's not within your geographical area for ancillary and auxiliary based mm. care and stuff. So yes the information can be useful we talked about the fact the information itself may not be comparable we've done lots of mm. um, information on this on our gpad episode that talks about how this information is derived so just to be clear they will be taking this information from the gpad service gp appointment database service and stuff um which is effectively extracted from the appointment book of general practices we know this data is not great and um, mm. it's better than what it was and it is the data that is used by NHS England that's published on a regular basis. And I've done a variety of posts to showcase some of that data. But we also know that generally speaking, this data is not correct, is not accurate. And actually the systems we have to make this data available really don't work very well. So actually make the data collection side of it really complicated and stuff. But we will be going into that in more detail a little bit later on. Yeah, good. So, and the final uh, point is um, a little bit perhaps om ominous. We'll require local NHS ICBs, integrated care boards, to hold practices to account, mm -hmm. providing support to those practices with the most acute access challenges to improve performance. Um, so there's an obligation on ICBs to, to do something yep. about where this data shows that there are outlying practices, Yes, I think is the implication of what's, yes. what's here. Um, and uh, they've used the word support, which I suppose is, is better than just saying address. Um, mm -hmm. Although, um, you know, if you're a practice in that position, it's going to feel very, very uncomfortable. Yep. Um, and that support will probably be both supportive and challenging. I suspect, yes. um, as it comes from the ICB. Um, but so it would be interesting to see how ICBs will interpret that and how they will see their roles in uh, supporting and improving performance. So that would be very interesting. And I think this will very much come down to your ICB, to be honest. Yeah. You, if you've got a generally positive, engaged and forward thinking ICB, I think this could be something that's really positive, um, both for the practices, but more importantly for patient care. I think if you've got an ICB that looks very insular, has significant financial challenges that are very much focused on the bottom line and less around the patient care delivery point of view, then this may be very much a situation that's going to be very complicated and challenging. Um, I've had experiences of both with our local mm. ICB um, side of things. Um, and I think, you know, it's going to be interesting for some practices. I, I think potentially this is going to cause a lot of stress. I think it's also going to have some benefits in certain areas as well.
Yeah, it will, it will be really interesting to see. And actually, we do, we do want more resources and attention focused where care is struggling. And mm -hmm. you know, if it delivers that, that will be a positive thing. But we will have to see how it is actually implemented. Mm -hmm. um, so the next case stage uh, of the document begins to talk about the, the A, B, C, D, D. D. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, what are they, Gandhi? Yeah, so this then talks about the fact that they're going to work with NHS England, deliver the plan, and the plan is based around the acronym ABCD. A, standing for ambulance, B, standing for backlog, C, standing for care, and D, we call it DD, yeah. because it's about doctors and dentists. Interestingly, as you mentioned, yeah. doctor seems to be supplanted by the word general practitioners on a repeated basis. Mm, so lots of focus on general practice here. Mm. Um, so the first A is... Is, is, is ambulances mm -hmm. um, essentially, and um, you know they want to shorten response times for the most urgent categories definitely of needed. ambulance calls, yeah. which which is obviously definitely needed. Mm. Um, I know just sort of anecdotally, and um, you know often being in that situation where a patient calls, mm -hmm. you call them, you tell them that they need to call an urgent ambulance because of the nature of what they've described to you on the telephone, and then you know, getting a call back from them, you know, sometime later the ambulance isn't here. You know, it's probably happened to a lot of GPs out there. So there definitely is a problem that is much worse now than than, than it ever has been yep. before in terms of ambulance response times. So that that, that does need some uh and I think it's important to recognise that this, this is not, you know, necessarily the, the, the issue that's been caused by the ambulance service, which is I know where some people, in particular the media, like to focus their attention. You know, we know that we've seen a reduction in the workforce capacity of the ambulance services. We know that they've been suffered by significant challenges of increase in demand massively so and various other things that are impacting this so the cost of petrol has a huge yeah. implication on the ambulance services in terms of what they can deliver and stuff and you know they are losing workforce significantly so so those are the challenges that exist um it's interesting to see that the viewpoint that Theresa Crofey's taken in terms of tackling this um yeah what did you think Andy <laughs> yeah so uh so there's, so there's mention of the, the handover so mm. that that is time consuming and um you know I've also seen on the news and actually seen sort of physically when I happen to have been in the accident emergency mm -hmm. department locally, um, you know, what appears to be queues of ambulances just waiting to offload patients yep. into the accident emergency department. So she wants to address that. Um, not not exactly clear how, um, but drawing attention on that. And then they want to increase the number of call handlers mm -hmm. is, is, is the main intervention sort of mentioned here, mm -hmm. which strikes me as interesting because it seems the problem really is a lack of ambulances um, <laughs> and paramedics, not necessarily the people to take calls from the public more quickly yes. to ask them to connect with ambulance services. So, um, <laughs> so I think that that's, that's interesting. Uh, they do talk about um, expanding the provision of kind of other places that I think those call handlers could direct patients to. Mm -hmm. So they talk about uh, 24 seven helplines for patients in mental health crisis, yep. which I think, May be helpful if they can if they're of sufficient quality to handle yeah. those patients that end up calling 999 because of a mental crisis I, I think you know actually i think this is a really positive thing it's one of the few things that i thought was a, a very good idea again the devil's in the detail and we'll see the execution of this what this actually means but you know if you have a 24 7 phone line that is available for people to contact about their mental health crises that is staffed by people trained in mental health this would be yeah. an amazing thing that I think will really help a challenging situation and a time when yeah. we know that the mental health challenges for our population are increasing and going to increase because the cost of living crisis is going to have a huge impact on the mental health of our population. So actually, that would be really positive. Mm. If it's the formulaic 111 algorithm that basically sends everybody to call an ambulance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it depends on how well equipped these helplines are to yeah. handle them. But I know that there's a shortage of of appropriately qualified mental health staff yes. working within the mental health services. So I'm not quite sure where these helplines will come from. Notice a theme, yeah. workforce. workforce. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so they talk about a few other things as well. Um, so they talk about sort of signposting people better more generally, uh, yeah. which I think if these extra call handlers are doing that mm -hmm. and not just sending people to the accident emergency department or their GP surgery, but to other destinations, yes. then that would be really, really helpful. Um, there's a, a paragraph about expanding the use of, of monitoring um, devices and solutions to help mm -hmm. monitor people's health in their own home, and, and I suspect care homes as well. Um, I'm thinking the idea here is to uh, both spot people before they become 
critically unwell mm -hmm. uh, and require that category one or category two ambulance and they can have a different response in the community yep. um so i think that's that's pretty good and then i guess to to better understand how unwell somebody is um when they call mm -hmm. you know rather than needing a paramedic crew to uh, go to the location to um, get a key piece of information like blood pressure or oxygen saturation. If those are available within the patient's home and those can be remotely monitored, exactly. then then that might negate the need for that ambulance. And, so, and we've seen some of this. So over the COVID pandemic, we knew that actually, generally speaking, a lot of people may suffer respiratory-based symptoms, but the ones you were more worried about, the ones where the SATs were dropping. And actually, if patients had SATs monitoring probes in the house, some people were provided them. Uh, yeah. as a result of the COVID plans and stuff. But actually, a lot of people have some of these equipment sometimes in their home, even on something as simple as a smart, smart device yeah. that you have. A lot of the newer, higher-end ones in particular do have medical-grade technology mm. in them that is slightly more reliable than you know a bargain basement 20 quid kind of one. Um, so it's important to recognise that you may have more metric information that's available either in individual homes you mentioned care homes is a great mm. place where remote monitoring could be really effective because actually these are the type of patients where you don't really want to transport to the hospital unless you absolutely need to. So having that kind of equipment available is definitely something we've talked about previously um, in terms of way things can happen. I think that's a really positive step if it's done again correctly. Yeah. It then also talks about falls preventions being a key part of this service as well and the response to falls. I mean, we know that yeah. falls, particularly in the elderly and the frail, unfortunately can have a really negative outcome. It's one of the yeah. unfortunate worst case scenarios for a lot of these patients and leading to, I think, partly they chuck this in because of some of the recent media stories about people that have had falls yeah. and unfortunately ambulance times have had to be very prolonged. I mean, there's been yeah. some fairly prolific stories about this recently. So I I do kind of wonder if this was specifically mentioned just to tackle that media cycle. Yeah, quite quite possibly. It's also probably a significant proportion of sort of calls mm. that they handle and um, and uh, you know homes that they need to attend are due to falls as well. Yeah, um, yeah. So that's it. That's so yes, yeah, they talk about recruit as you mentioned recruiting yeah. more people. So four thousand eight hundred um, extra people in NHS one one one. 2,500 people in 999 service and stuff by December. So it's a short time frame. That's good. But again, they haven't really got anywhere to send them. But hey, anyway. Um, and then it talks about the halos, um, which uh, just for clarity, this is not a game that we're yeah. talking about. We're not talking about the game Halo. Or, or I think there's a film or a TV series coming out about it. But yeah. hospital um, ambulance liaison officers, I think is their term. So basically yeah. a interface person to manage the care. Mm, yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't. Do these posts already exist, or is this a new post? It strikes me someone would be doing that job already. I, yes. Um, so I think there may be people who are already doing this, either under this name yeah. or under other guises. Often, I, I mean, when I remember when I yeah. used to work in A and E, you would have one of the charge nurses that would meet um, patients coming in via ambulance, and then they would risk stratify them. And I think this is partly to hand over the patients, because as you mentioned, there have been certain areas where they have had bed blocking as a result mm. of it and that's had a huge impact on terms of the ambulances queuing and waiting and what do you do with these patients who are stuck with an ambulance crew who aren't able to hand over those ambulances obviously yeah. can't go back out and see more patients which is part of the issue but then the problem you've got is that you need someone who can stay with that potentially high risk person mm. um and if you don't have the capacity in the any &E department which is the reason why they're having to wait then who's going to manage that? So is it going to be somebody who's floating between them, a halo person, you know, for example, to manage that care? What yeah. if those people are genuinely urgent or more importantly, deteriorate in the time that they're there? That's, I think, the big question that's challenging to understand. Love to hear from anybody who does this role. And if yeah. you do so and you're watching, let us know in the comments, please. I'd love to know more about this. Yeah. Um, and yeah, facilitating ambulance trust to support each other during busiest periods. So, um, so I guess it's a bit, a bit like when when you go to a protest event, or mm. not that I protest all the time, and you have police from different areas that have come in to support that police service. Mm. Um, I guess it's about moving ambulance resources around to neighbouring areas to support them when they're struggling. It, it sounds like common sense. Um, I hope well, to be honest, from what we're hearing, me. all of them are struggling. So, yeah, no, how much difference that really makes? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's difficult. You need more resource to begin with, I think. Uh, the next the next bullet point is interesting because it's only a few words, but it sounds like it could be potentially huge, which is ex exploring, so not necessarily doing, but exploring establishing a new ambulance auxiliary service. Very interested to know exactly what they mean there. Yeah. You could s speculate that this is another level of ambulance service, which is um, a less acute mm. service, um, perhaps more focused on transport and less mm. around emergency 
care. I know they do have transport ambulances anyway, but yeah. um, but maybe this is more about taking a certain category of case with less medical input and assessment directly to another location for assessment. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, we don't know, but no. but it's interesting. That could be big or it could disappear I must because admit, they're just exploring it. This envisions um, images for me of, you know, the auxiliary fire services that people mm. used to have in, in smaller towns and that kind of stuff that the people would be drafted in oh. to call upon for when there was a, a you know, you significant right. problem and stuff. And, and therefore, you know, it's that whole concept of, I don't know, I'm getting war torn images of having yeah. to tackle an emergency situation, that kind of stuff. Is that what we should be doing yeah. for our health? The, bleep, the bleeper goes off. Yeah. Uh, neighbor, yeah. Neighbor's fallen on the floor. Got to go and pick yeah. her up. Uh, I yeah, I don't know. I mean, so, I mean, you know, community spirit shouldn't be underestimated True. within within communities. And we um, saw the benefit of community spirit over the COVID pandemic mm. with the um, you know NHS volunteer service, which originally was mentioned in a lot of the documents, but isn't mentioned in this particular one about the concept of volunteering but i think this is where this has come into it so the original kind of pre-league stuff was very much yeah. talking about nhs volunteers yeah i, I think this is a yeah I, mean, they do, I think they do acknowledge that that's somewhere in terms of just make it that they are a resource to potentially convert into mm -hmm. um into into workforce to address some of these points going forwards so that's interesting um next we talk about creating more capacity in hospitals which is yep. obviously a big uh problem uh they're going to open up the equivalent of seven thousand uh beds um doesn't we have a population of 6.6 .6 million or or, in, or, in, million. Or, or or england england and wales specifically is going to be you know less than that but not much i think maybe about mm. 50, about 60 uh, 60 million people so it's not a great deal of beds next to well, i believe there's a hundred thousand hospital beds currently in the uk so this is a seven percent potential increase important to know that over the uh, yeah so it's significant important to know that over the previous few years actually they've closed probably that amount of beds um mm. so part of the reason we are in the situation is actually the fact that there has very much been a direction of closing hospital beds and moving people into the community that never dealt with the fact that there's always a need for hospital beds yes they may feel expensive at times but actually sometimes you just need a bed for a patient in a hospital because it's the best place for that person to be mm. And that's where backlogs come yeah. into play to a degree, isn't it? So we know that there's issues with the backlog. So this is the B element of things. The backlog is a huge challenge that we knew was going to happen mm. as a result of COVID. It had an impact. You know, it's going to have an ongoing impact. And this is not something that's going to be fixed in a short space of time. But the waiting time is astronomical in some places. Yeah. And I think this is, just to put it out there, this is... A problem that I think we spend quite a lot of time addressing as GPs. Yes. There's a lot of focus put on um, uh, this idea that access to GPs you know, is not where it should be. I think mm -hmm. that's probably right, and that drives uh, pressure on access to emergency departments, for example. Uh, you know, and that's not right either. Mm -hmm. But um, the converse is also true. So I see a lot of patients who don't need to see me as a GP for mm. any other reason other than they feel they've been waiting too long for their secondary yes. care uh, appointment and they will book an appointment and they will come and see me they will talk to me on the telephone um, and you know I will give them the number for the hospital secretary and ask mm. them to chase that up with the relevant department very occasionally I might I might write you know a begging letter you know asking them to be prioritized or brought forwards very rarely will i do that and which you know, often makes no difference as well it often makes to recognize that yeah um, yeah. It, yeah it often makes no difference because often they're aware of the clinical situations if, if mm. something has not materially changed in that person's illness then it probably won't make a difference because they were prioritized you know initially mm. when they got the referral um but it creates a lot of of work you know in general practice and those are appointments that could be used for people who who need to see as well within go to the emergency department so everything just starts to get backed up so backlogs are important i'm not hitting the fact i've had clinics where 30 percent of the patient contacts i've had have been purely because of patients waiting to be seen by secondary care services and we are stuck until they get the next stage of their journey of their care and that's just a situation that we're dealing with. Often when I refer patients nowadays, mm. you know, they ask me how long is it till I'm being seen and I, I literally have to reply with, I'm really sorry, I have no idea. You yeah. know, it could be weeks, it could be months, it could be years. Mm. There are some waiting lists that are now ranked in years. Yes. That is the time frame that we are talking about for some situations. It is a massive challenge and there is no easy answer to this, absolutely. The question is, does this plan help with that so my impression reading the next few paragraphs was that they're restating um a number of funding pledges that have been made yep. in the past to address this problem 
and I didn't see a great deal of new funding or new initiatives um, to address this problem, which was interesting. But I guess it's not going to be solved overnight by those existing no. interventions. And we do need to allow time for the money to filter through um, and you know actually be delivered and for the these interventions that are being funded to be put into place. Um, so, but I didn't see a great deal of new funding. I don't know how you felt about the Agreed. I mean, it talks about things that were existing plans. So if you have a closer look at them, so it talks about, I think, the building of um, new hospitals. These are hospitals that have already been planned. Um, and it's the fact that they're all underway. Or upgrades. Uh, yeah, or upgrades. Um, I'd love to know how they suddenly found a way of speeding a lot of this up um, without any additional funding, because I can't see any significant additional funding that they're putting in. It's the original 1.5 billion they've originally committed. It's not new money. Yeah. They then talked about a fun statement about maximizing the use of the independent sector. So this is using private providers to supplement NHS capacity. Um, it's paid for at a slightly premium rate compared to what mm. the NHS providers would get in order to convince the independent sector to help out. Can definitely work, has worked. I've you know been party to it. I've, I've had mm. care developed, delivered to me by a private yeah. provider on behalf of the NHS because capacity was at such an issue. Um, but it's that whole concept of it. they tend to take the easier stuff, leaving the more complicated stuff for the NHS uh, because yeah. of risk assessments, because of capacity and all that kind of stuff. And that has an implication and things. And it will not raise the question of those contracts that inevitably mm. are developed for this. There's always been concerns about that. And it, yeah. Yeah. And it, it feels a little, I may be wrong, but it feels a little bit like a quick fix in yeah. a way. This doesn't necessarily build uh, capacity within the NHS that mm -hmm. you can use year in year out you know you are purchasing often at a premium capacity provided by other people and it mm -hmm. it increases their ability to make that capacity available to you in the future at a premium but it yeah. doesn't necessarily increase um, native NHS capacity um, it's interesting they they talk next about um, pension changes um, this is I know you've done some some work with medics money and you, yep. you're probably a little bit closer to the pension changes um, and the pension challenges mm. faced by uh, some NHS GPs and some NHS consultants that disincentivizes them from doing extra work and yep. sometimes actually means that it's just not cost effective for them to work and they reduce their hours. Um, maybe not talking about all of that in no. detail here, but do these sound like they might address that problem? Well, hopefully uh, part of the rules are around this are stuff that is uh, embedded in financial law. So it does require changes to the law in order to make these things happen. It's to do with the fact that the NHS pension is linked to inflation with a significant increase from rise in inflation happening. It now has several clinicians and this is on the word clinicians is not just GPs. In fact, a lot of this is hospital consultants as a significant proportion of it who are now at the stage where their pension pots are now causing a tax um, trap for them that mm. actually means that they are now paying to work. Their income that they get from working won't even cover the amount of tax they subsequently have to pay. It is a crazy system that was actually designed to stop people from high earners from um, getting away with paying tax. But actually, mm. because of the NHS pension structure specifically, it has a real implication for doctors. This needs changing. This is one of the reasons mm. why we have a reducing workforce, because people are physically having to pay to work and unfortunately it's the most experienced mm. people that can do all the work that they want to do and they're just saying well why would i pay so they're stopping this needs fixing and it needs fixing really really quickly because people are actually leaving the profession because of this yeah yeah it's, it's crazy it's like why would i pay 16 pay 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 the tax man 16 pounds an hour to go and work mm. you know uh, a, a clinic you know it's just absolutely insane so okay so hopefully that will be addressed and it's nice to see it giving prominence within you know this strategic document yep. so that's so that's good um they're going to uh recruit fifty thousand more nurses by 2024 yep. which i think is good and i think that'll help um with hospital capacity i'm not seeing anywhere in this document talk about recruiting additional gps or additional doctors no nope, not at all. anywhere within the document you could argue that's because they've learned from the fact that every single pledge they've made to increase gp numbers has failed miserably um, interestingly, it talks about recruiting 50,000 more nurses um, by 2024, that they're on track for delivering 29,000 by June 2020. Actually, a lot of this is, probably would have been doing far better um, if they hadn't got rid of the NHS bursaries for nurses anyway. So yeah. that's one of the key reasons many people know that a lot of people stopped wanting to become nurses and they've started to bring back some of the funding to allow that to happen more effectively. Yeah. It's still nowhere near the number we need, though. Yeah. Uh, 
providing patients with quicker, more convenient access to treatment um, through use of virtual outpatient appointments sounds. What do you think? Well, sensible? Okay, it sounds sensible. It does, and and, and it's great. I actually, yeah. we're big fans of remote care, yeah. um, so I think this is a great idea. What I don't like is the fact that when general practice did this, the media basically slammed every general practice across the country for doing what they are now recommending that outpatient clinics should be doing. And they should be doing it. It is a definite better way to manage a lot of patients. But there's no outcry yeah. about this. There's no commentary from various people that have slammed general practice, vilified general practice about the fact that we delivered remote care at the time that was essential to do so and often can be really beneficial. Mm. So where is the pushback on this? Why is it not an issue for the media when secondary care did I don't know, it, it may be a personal thing, I feel. But I feel really aggrieved about this one because actually general practice was vilified for doing what they were told to do. Um, and yet now it seems to be the miraculous way that they're going to fix the NHS backlog. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not going to disagree with you, Gandhi. And in fact, um, it's it sounds good mm. on, the, on the face of it. And I think for a number of patients with certain types of problems, Absolutely. a virtual appointment will meet their need but i think that we shouldn't become too focused on virtual outpatient appointments and actually for some patients or for many patients with many types of medical problems they do need to physically see someone yeah. to either be just physically examined get that quality of face-to-face -face interaction um or a lot of our patient clinics are structured such that when they are there they will have some um quick uh diagnostic tests yes. you know, that can be done at that appointment and the other key thing is absolutely removing any form of contractual basis that means that a, pay, a clinic can discharge a patient because they haven't picked up their phone. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know how many yeah. patients you are yeah. having to refer back because of this simple issue, but apparently, um, not apparently, um, evidenced by many situations we've experienced, patients are discharged because they haven't picked up the phone at the time of a virtual appointment has been. Um, and there can be a variety of reasons why that mm. happens. And as a result of that, that then requires them to have a re-referral back to the service. They start back at the beginning. It causes chaos for everybody, conflict for everybody. Yeah. That part of the contract needs to be removed. Yeah. Okay. So proceed with caution on that one. Sorry. Um, <laughs> as you can tell, I'm quite passionate about this one. It seems like a small line, but it's one that has significant implications, I think. Yeah. And they so, and they talk about in improving the availability of mental health services. Yes. I think they're talking about counselling psychotherapy services, both mm -hmm. for adults and for children. And that sounds very laudable, um, Definitely. I think. So hopefully that will happen um they talk about um uh, clinical diagnostic centers um mm -hmm. and uh improving or increasing the rollout of those centers there are a number already operating yeah. within the country i don't think there are any in our in our area that i can think of unless you're aware of mm, some cdcs i think i've seen one in nottingham um okay. so yeah um uh, this is definitely some of the plans move forward it, yeah. it's outlined in the fuller stock take yeah. in particular it mentions about creating these test centers for people to use closer to the community and i think if they are closer to the community absolutely great if these are just housed in big hospital buildings well there's completely no point to it to be honest yeah. um mobile units really potentially a, an opportunity for change i think and particularly for tackling you know um rural or deprived populations i think would be a really positive state yeah. and, and to move for um again it's responsibility to the tests and, and funding and stuff that comes into play that has an implication for some of this and things so. exactly uh i, I think a, a concern i might i might have is so at the moment in order to access certain diagnostics people need to um attend or be referred to uh, a hospital clinic yeah for example there's just the grain of a, a potential opportunity for secondary care to sort of devolve uh access to um, certain very specialist diagnostic tests potentially to GPs but also the responsibility for then dealing with the results that would have previously yep. been held by hospital clinics so I think this needs to be done together with secondary care so that Absolutely. the ownership of what might be some quite complicated patients having quite complicated tests or scans for complex indications that the ownership of that is is, is shared or remains in the right place so but yeah proceed with caution that's mm -hmm. good um, prioritizing patients with the greatest need that makes sense i don't know if there's pending how it's done okay that's very good yeah the devil's always in the detail as ever the devil's in the detail <laughs> and the reason for this is simply i've already heard of a place where this has started to be actioned um in order to prioritize the patient with the greatest need um those on the waiting list are being sent back um letters to their gps to reassess 
whether these patients still need those kind of levels of mm. care. Yeah. The problem with that is increasing workload in general practice. It's delaying potential for other patients to have that access. And actually, is that the responsibility of the GP to manage at that point? Because I mean, it's a service capacity issue. Um, and also, who assesses what need is? Yeah. It's an area which yeah. needs more detail. As ever, a lot of the, as you're going to find, figure out from what a lot of our talks about this, there's just no detail. But hey, it's a plan. It's not an actual document of change. Yeah. So we've got two paragraphs about um, using um, data yeah. and using digital tu tools uh, to increase patient choice mm -hmm. um, and operational productivity, to read the words that are there. Any thoughts on on this. Uh, I mean, a lot of this already exists. The data is out there. Um, yeah. I, I wonder if this in some way relates to the, the concept of patients being able to choose which hospital they have their care from, which is yeah. not a bad thing necessarily, yeah. but it's also helping patients to understand the implications of that choice. So, for example, if I wanted to have a, a surgery done and in Sheffield, it happened to be a lot quicker and sooner that I would be seen and, and stuff to do that. And I was prepared to drive to Sheffield mm -hmm. from Nottingham every single time to have my appointment. Fine. But then what happens when I have to care? Yeah. You know, what happens if there's a complication? Do I go back to my GP? Well, that may be sensible, that may not be sensible. Mm -hmm. Or if I need acute admission, that's that information is not transferred across easily. Unfortunately, trusts are not really good at sharing information quickly and effectively. I mean, sometimes they're really slow at sharing with general practice, which is where their direct line of communication should already be with. So it's, again, it's just understanding those processes. I think patient held records will have a massive benefit in this, mm -hmm. but we need to help our patients understand the implications and the benefits of patient health records in order to streamline some of that, because mm. that I think would help make this more manageable. Yeah, so potentially beneficial, but potentially confusing yes. for patients if not done in if done the right well, way. I think this could be a really positive step. Um, fortunately, my cynicism is creeping <laughs> in a little bit. And they also talk about the, the, the data around primary care performance to help patients make a choice about where they get yeah. their primary care, uh, which we talked about previously. Um, Care, so care here, I think they mean social care. So this care. is the C, yep. yeah. So this is, as you mentioned, it's about social care. And in particular, the main pro, uh, this is this 500 million pound adult social care discharge fund. Mm. So um, this is not part of the funding that was originally outlined. I think there was an original plan for something like 7 billion being given to social care to help support okay. things. I don't know, um, I'll take your word for it. I can't remember the exact numbers, apologies if I've got that wrong. Um, so do check up on that number. I think the important thing to recognize this, and it's a really short line that mentions this. Um, I want to, uh, where are we? Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, the first step will inform our further action from next year to rebalance funding across health and care to establish a strong and sustainable social care. So it's not clear where this money's coming from. And reading around this topic, and particularly some of the articles that come around it, there is a, a suspicion that this will be money that's transferred from health to social care mm. which yeah, that, that was that, always a concern wasn't it yeah. with a combination of the health uh, and social care briefs to one minister of state mm -hmm. and talk of combining budgets um i mean the two do interrelate isn't it and you, the argument is that you can release uh, resources and pressures within the health service by improving social care so Absolutely. that people can move out of the health service into the social care service um but yeah the the, the fear is that uh, rather than addressing problems with social care head on, the, the government yeah. may be actually taking money um, which is allocated for health so spending on social care. We talked about earlier that apparently there's 100,000 beds across you know England um, that are in hospital services. It's estimated approximately 13,000 of those are blocked because of social care challenges mm -hmm. in terms of places to discharge patients to, whether that's care homes, residential homes, or their own home and the support yeah. services to manage that. So you know that, that raises the question of those extra 7,000 they're planning on is not even going to make a dent in that yeah. blockage and stuff. So they need to do something else. This is what they're suggesting so that you know some of that fund will be able to help streamline and prioritize the discharge of yeah. patients that um you know then those beds can also be used for patients for other needs um and then there's a push to get more people into care as a profession hmm. or as a work and stuff and this is where that employment stuff that we talked about yeah. earlier comes into play so it talks about um working with the dwp to promote care as an occupation for people in terms of those that are currently unemployed Okay, that's yeah. definitely a positive step to take. It also talks about investing fifteen million pounds to bring in carers from abroad, which I never really expected to hear from the Tories, to be honest. No, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know what to, to say about to say about that one really. Um, uh, I, I guess what we're what we're implying, which may not be true, is 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 that um, 
you know, a lot of the Tory agenda has been about Brexit, some of that fueled by mm -hmm. hostility towards immigration and so forth. So, but, but again, actually, I think what I see though, because people um, can be a little bit split in how they see this, because uh, whilst people might vote for governments with um, a less favourable view of immigration, often actually when they're receiving care from mm. somebody from another country within the health or social care system, they're really, really grateful and they really, really mm. love those people. Um, so, uh, so it's interesting. And I think it, it just speaks to the need. I mean, obviously, we are not anticipating to be able to get enough people mm -hmm. from the native workforce to fill all of the care roles that yeah. there are and that there will be in the future as as we um, have an aging population with more people needing mm -hmm. care um so i think it just speaks to the the realities of it um i think it's interesting that i i have often over the last few years found myself actually promoting careers in care when i'm having mm -hmm. conversations about employment with people um because i think it's an area of need it, it can be rewarding work it Very can rewarding. be it can be stressful mm -hmm. uh, but for some people it's really really great and people don't always automatically think about it mm -hmm. um if they don't know someone who works in the sector so i think it's a you know it's a good aim um yeah i was just going to talk about uh, one other thing just about um the um shift of uh patients from hospital beds mm -hmm. to social care whilst they're waiting for their social care to be finalized and sorted because i don't know about you but we've had experience of uh spare capacity within our local care homes mm -hmm. being purchased by um uh by the yeah, nhs bodies uh, probably by the by the trust or social care mm. or some sort of partnership to move people uh, from a hospital bed into a care home or mm. nursing home bed uh, while they sit there for a few weeks it, uh, while their social care is sorted out, yeah. their care package rather than waiting in the hospital. And that obviously saves a lot of money in the hospital. Mm. And it's a very good thing. Although what happens is we've now got a unit with quite a number of beds on that wasn't there before. Mm. And there aren't hospital doctors looking after these patients. No. It's now GPs. So it's just really increased the pressure on on general practice and that part of it isn't funded so mm. we're just just advising a word of caution around these sorts of uh, interventions unfunded unresourced lack of workforce care yet again yeah <laughs> so just just be careful how these things are implemented but i think the the aims are uh, mm. laudable it's just the impl the implementation can be really really complex to get right yeah uh, they then also talk about improving the IT for carers. So a lot of caring, um, social care in particular, is paper-based. Absolutely looking at moving that to an IT base can have benefits. Important to recognise the onboarding and training to make sure that happens and the data integrity issues. Mm -hmm. mm, don't forget that. And lastly, it talks about delivering the cap and means test for social care reform. So this is the concept that once you hit a particular level that you then have to pay for your mm -hmm. um, social care. Um, this is going off trailblazer locations that they've started um, and yeah I, I don't know enough about this to talk about it i i don't know what <laughs> what they mean yeah. i understand what a cap is and i understand what a means test is but i'm not quite sure in what direction they're implying this will go that mm -hmm. that more people will have to contribute more for their care or that less people will have to contribute more for their care i don't know what this means but it'll be very interesting to see how it pans out okay. and the next the next section is titled doctors but it's largely about primary care yes um or general practice uh these next two paragraphs i think are really ominous just 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 to, to to read them so okay primary care is extra two billion has been invested into primary care in the last two years patients tell us that making an appointment in general practice has become more difficult in recent years we expect that patients who need an appointment with their gp practice within two weeks should get one and that patients with urgent needs should be seen on the same day it almost sounds like we've put some money into this sector we are not mm. seeing results and we expect things to improve those two paragraphs feel like a bit of a uh, a wrap on the wrists it uh, does doesn't it uh, the, yeah um and, and a bit of a warning so that's that and the whole document that's the bit that upset me the most um i think um and of course they've not necessarily listened to what people in general practice have said is needed or what patients may have said and maybe i'm being a bit controversial here but mm -hmm. there has been a lot of new funding for general practice um and it's largely been for for new roles um mm -hmm. it's lot you know the vast majority of that it has been not possible and not permissible for it to be spent on gps yep. or for it to be practice nurses who historically have done practically all of the work in general practice exactly. there are a lot of new roles that are funded um and this is largely through the primary care network funding that mm -hmm. we're talking about and the new roles are 
very, very helpful and very, very useful uh, and are becoming really important to ongoing delivery of primary care. But when people want to see a GP, you know, that money is not necessarily helping directly. Yep. Yes, it may take away some of the other people that might be seeing that GP you want to see on that day so you can see them. Um, but I don't know. I just feel it's it's strong language. And uh, yeah, what do you think? Yeah. So as you mentioned, I mean, the two billion it's talking about is the primary care network funding that started in 2019 um, and has gradually improved mm -hmm. and increased since then. Um, it. In, in the majority, um, I'm assuming it's talking about some other funding pots as well. Um, and the reality is none of that money was available to use for increasing GP or nurse capacity, which is what patients traditionally see as general practice care. So um, there is definitely the funding for the additional roles, which is the lion's share of that funding across the whole of the England in particular. Um, and they have really effective uses, but patients still comment that because they haven't seen a GP, they don't feel of had the service that they were hoping for in some situations and and that's where maybe the expectations is not a case of actually you need a wrap on the knuckles because you've not mm. done what we told you to do we've done what we were told to do general practice has done what it was told to do and yet we're seeing the outcomes of that which is actually the education of patients in particular mm. around the change in service health service hasn't happened and therefore that's why there's a dissatisfaction and in actual fact there was a recent study that got published about a month or so ago that showed that satisfaction has mm. dropped because of the additional roles because they're not as in some ways effective mm. as seeing a clinician like a gp absolutely this has happened because there just isn't enough gps we keep saying this yeah. repeatedly and uh we might come to the bma's response but the bma outline um the issue with uh gp numbers uh in detail in their response so we'll probably just signpost to that uh yeah so Teresa Covey has also mentioned yeah. that apparently the gp workforce has stabilized um for clarity in that term it seems like total gp numbers has stabilized because actually there are more gps coming through however because of the challenges that many are facing they are now working less in, than full time although for many people that's still 40 hours plus a week so dear daily mail who's now going to comment on this you know important to remember just because a gp is working three or four days a week isn't the same as working you know um three or four days in a normal job a typical day in general practice is 12 hours plus currently important to recognize this so um you know there is that shift that we are seeing in terms of numbers and actually the numbers are going down so the numbers of gp partners mm -hmm. is going down the numbers of um that locums is changing in particular i think salaries is actually the only one that's stabilized to some degree and close to being stabilized mm -hmm. but so, a lot of people are working less sessions in the week though so yes. if you think about the full-time equivalent gp it numbers is dropping like a lead they are uh, they are dropping and nowhere near the promised plan of six thousand extra gps by 2024 so yeah, Jeremy Hunt. Um, I don't know if so. He had a good tweet where he um, just this week he just tweeted a sign that was on the door of a local GP surgery in his constituency that just said that there was something on the lines of you know for the foreseeable future we will not be um, you know operating uh, at full capacity. The reason for this is uh, you know an, an acute and chronic lack of workforce. Mm -hmm. Full stop. And um, you know Jeremy Hunt saw fit to to tweet that, which I thought was very interesting. Yeah, given he started all this, but yeah. You know, anyway, well, uh, I do. He, he, yeah. We have talked about the fact he that he seems to be making a period of time. <laughs> let's be clear. He started the plans. The yeah. five-year forward view, which was his uh, design, um, is the original one that was meant to have us five thousand extra GPs, yeah. and then that got changed to six thousand GPs with a subsequent uh, long-term plan and stuff. Um, however. He has tried to make repatriations for this as far as we can see, and then it's definitely changed his tone compared to when he was a health secretary, whether, that, again, that was because he was in the job or now out of the job and stuff, but yes. Um, interesting, the BMA response is very condemning about some of the changes mentioned in this plan, in particular the fact that they weren't discussed in terms of making this mm -hmm. plan. Same by the RCGP. It's one of the few times I've seen a very forthright response by the RCGP mm. um, um, in particular, and kudos to them for doing so. You know, not waiting for, for this to be a bigger problem and things and very clearly outlining the fact that everyone is disappointed with some of the, the aspects of this plan um, because it just seems to have been absolutely no engagement with the profession about these particular parts. Yeah. Yeah, we went we went uh, pick apart those responses, but they are they are fairly short and they are worth worth reading. And the mm -hmm. BMA in particular talks about um, GP numbers, uh, which I think is quite interesting and interesting information that can be conveyed to patients to help them sort of understand the situation a little bit better mm -hmm. as well. Uh, but um, so access to general practice, this is a large part of uh, the document. Um, it goes into more detail on some of the 
the, the the numbers and some of the interventions that were mentioned earlier in the document mm -hmm. uh, so this is where we get a little bit more expansive uh detail so uh, in order to make it easier we're going to have those additional phone lines it does actually talk about cloud-based or soft mm -hmm. phone solutions and uh accelerating the delivery and availability yep. of those to general practice which I think is, is sensible they are good systems um they're talking about the one million additional appointments mm -hmm. we talked about that sounds a lot but may not be uh, as much uh, as it as it feels um and they talk about uh, additional roles actually so they talk about gp assistants and advanced practitioners in particular um as uh, as roles that could help general practice process mm -hmm. more patients i know you've talked about gp assistants for example yeah. in, in the past is that something you're excited about? absolutely i'd love to know more i'd love to know how we can do this process this is change it, it, and just for clarity, I suspect, although it isn't outlined in this document, yeah. this is just going to add them to the additional roles reimbursement yeah. scheme. Um, as of effectively 1st of October, we have heard musings about this. So it's increasing the number of roles that's then available to use your ARS spend on. Um, I believe at last count there's about 500 odd GP assistants currently in the UK. Um, so that's not a huge amount. And, you know, uh, the onboarding, I'm speaking to some people who have been doing this. It takes about nine months or so for someone to become a GP assistant in terms of the educational courses and things. I think they have real potential benefit for helping with the workload pressures that general practice is facing. Not just GPs, but general mm -hmm. practice is facing. However, I think there's also many places and many practices that already have people doing this stuff um, in di just in, named in different roles. Um, mm -hmm. Whether it's, you know, a com it's effectively a combination of a receptionist typist role and a healthcare assistant is probably the best way of describing mm -hmm. it in short form. However, there is definitely capacity for what they could do. Um, I think, again, you know, important to recognise there's absolutely some of the challenges that come through in terms of supervision, training, education, all that kind of stuff that comes with it. Advanced practitioners, slightly different. You know, it specifically mentioned about advanced mm -hmm. nurse practitioners, which is one of the key roles that actually... I'm going to say this, if these two roles had been available at the start of the ARS mm. scheme, at the start of the PCNs, actually, I think we would be in a significant different place of where workforce capacities and, and outcomes are. Mm. So it's not, I, I, I am genuinely positive about this. However, yeah. <laughs> um, important to recognize this is a change that's using existing funding. There is no additional funding for this. Um, it's using existing funding and using plans that many networks have already put in place. Yeah. This has literally just come out after we submitted our plans for what we're planning, you know, aiming to do with the network. So this is going to create a lot of workload shift and change in, within networks themselves to figure this out. And I suspect there's going to be a massive scramble um, mm. for, for trying to find people to fill for these roles because they actually have genuine potential benefit for the efficiency of general practice potentially mm, because to find someone and talk 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 to them we'll have to see if we can rustle some up yeah maybe well if anyone's possibly, out there yeah <laughs> possibly that's going to be an upcoming episode so we are going to go into more detail about particularly what a gpa can do and um, in due course hopefully we just need to find somebody who can just have to talk about it wink wink nudge nudge steve um but yeah um in terms of I'm genuinely positive about this, um, yeah. but there are some challenges, as ever, with a lot of the detail and stuff in this document and things. Yeah, so so we're, they, they mentioned again about I, uh, IT systems to automate uh, mm. certain activities. Um, so I think that's going to be a very positive thing. Uh, they talk again uh, about correcting pension Actually, issues. So I'm going to focus on. So this particularly is looking at um, when COVID first hit, there was a lot of um, additional funding that was brought into place to support practices for delivering systems. So, you know, um, the online consultation mm. platforms and stuff. Yeah. There hasn't been a lot of chatter about what's going to happen to how that funding is going to move forward. So actually clarity on this is going to stabilize a mm. lot of ICBs. So it would be really nice to know how this is going to work, because actually, if this is funding that's now going to be recommended to transfer to PCNs, that's a problem for PCNs to find the level of funding that some of these mm. systems have. Because currently the CCGs don't at that time didn't have funding for this. The ICBs don't have funding for this. So if this is coming with additional funding to make sure this part of the process is a mandatory part of general practice, which it should be, let's be clear on that point, mm -hmm. this may actually be more important than people realize. Again, devil in the detail. We have no detail yet. Yeah. But we will mm -hmm. find out. You've actually just made me a little bit more worried there, just thinking about where they will make um the obligation to fund this mm -hmm. lie. Uh, in yeah. the future, 
so you've just raised a bit more of a spectrum, a bit more of a question mark than I had there already. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the tools are, are useful and it's important um, to get sort of the pension issues, hopefully, fingers fingers crossed on on, on that one. Um, and again, they're just reminding us that ICBs uh, will be expected to intervene uh, where services need to be mm -hmm. improved. Um, they talk again about um, informing patients about performance data for their general practice, mm -hmm. um, numbers of appointments, how long they wait to enable them to make informed choices and to drive improvement of those met metrics mm -hmm. um, as practices see how they compare to other uh, other practices and then change and the way they definitely record. Definitely join us for our episode that's going to talk about this in more detail, specifically System 1 practice, because both me and Andy use System 1. But this is going to be a really important one that perhaps I think we can need to engage with before the audits come out in November. Yeah, it's so dependent on how you on how you record this. Yeah. Uh, and there's so much most practices could probably do to improve their data by recording no, the absolutely. work they do properly mm -hmm. and recording everything that they do in a way that will be counted because there's a lot of uncounted work at the moment but there's more detail on that elsewhere so that's good um they're going to launch a new community pharmacy offer to reduce reliance on gps i'm sure i've heard this at least sort of two three or four times in the every in year the past. the past four years um, the, yeah. i saw teresa coffee on the the news saying that you will be able to see your uh pharmacist if you have a sore throat uh for example which i think we can do now and there's currently yeah. uh, another incarnation of the community pharmacy referral scheme that were um rolling out through primary care networks and encouraging as our, our practices and local pharmacies to engage with to enable just such things to happen mm -hmm. i was wondering if they might go further and perhaps you know, devolve a few um easily divisible areas of prescribing over to community pharmacy i'm thinking about maybe simple contraception prescriptions mm -hmm. you know if, if that's something that could just be taken off the plate yep of um of general practice and primary care and there may be a few other examples they're not really implying that in terms of what they've yeah. said and it's it, it sounds a bit more like community pharmacy referral scheme again um but there's still opportunity for pharmacies to do more if they have pharmacy staff to do it because we've been recruiting a lot of community pharmacists into primary care to work in our primary care networks over the next years and actually i'm aware that a lot of our local community pharmacies when we've had discussions about them doing just this type of work tell us that they don't have enough pharmacists to do it or yep. often you know there isn't a pharmacist available to do that work in that particular building so they can't offer yep. that service so uh, there's a real problem with the number of pharmacists to deliver these sorts of interventions um, it's a good idea but i'm not sure the workforce is there as with many of these um, mm -hmm. ideas in the document See, so, yeah, I've got a much better idea that will fix a lot more of the pharmacy-based issues that, and actually improve workforce capacity in some way. Um, so simply take away the whole requirement that a medication has to be prescribed by a specific name um, mm -hmm. so the pharmacist can use their evident knowledge to change to a different formulation version when that particular one's out of stock. You know, the stocking of medications is becoming an increasing and greater challenge over time. Um, and the amount of work it is creating is so stupid at times that just because this particular medication is not available in a tablet form because that particular version is now out of stock in that pharmacy by their supply chains, that they need another prescription to put it in the um, capulet form yeah. or, you know, just those kind of things, changing the denomination. Mm -hmm. So if you're on 100 milligrams, you can have 250s instead, which is simple logic. But because of the rules that exist, and this is not blaming pharmacists, this is about mm. the rules of how the, everything works. They can't change that directly. Sensible, you know, collaborative pharmacists will often manage that quickly and effectively mm. rather than insisting they have another prescription first. But it's a problem. It's a growing problem because supply chains, as we know, are scuppered completely. Mm. Um, and as a result of that, actually, it would save so much time in general practice by having a simple change like this. Therese Kofi, if you stuck that in, you would have solved so much more problems. But yeah. That's good. So you heard it, you heard it here. It's a, it's, it's, it's a really good idea, Gandhi. If it comes in, I want attribution for that idea because such a, well, such you know, a time it's not my idea necessarily, but yeah. So the next the next D is dentists. <laughs> um, yeah, and actually increasing I'm increasingly seeing people contact us because they can't get a dentist. Um, uh, you know, it is something that I have noticed through my day-to-day -day practice, actually, so it's obviously a problem. Mm -hmm. and, you know, It's been getting some media coverage uh, recently. So it's up here in the document, um, and they are seeking to address it. I don't know what you, what you made of this, 
section, Gandhi, is they're acknowledging the problem. Um, I guess they're talking about we will make sure that the right incentives are in place so that patients mm. get the care they need. So I don't know if they're they're implying they're going to look at the current contracting model yep. for dentists or mm. the um, you know incentive of payment levels within that mm. to 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 redress those. It, it, it's probably needed. Um, I mean, the problem with dentistry is I think a lot of dentists have just found that it is not cost effective to deliver care under the NHS contract mm. and that it is much more cost effective to deliver care uh, privately to patients. Um, and uh, I don't fully understand dentistry um, contracting, Gandhi, and you may know more than me, but it seems like it's much easier for dentists than it is, say, for GPs to stop giving care to a certain proportion yep. of uh, the population or people who ask for it from them and focus on other groups um, that may be more cost effective to deliver care to. And I believe that that's what's happened. So I think they're talking about redressing um, some of those imbalances and misaligned incentives, which I think will be a positive thing. I don't know what dentists will think about that, but um, I can try since Andy's asked me to. Um, so clarity, I'm not a dentist. Um, I have a couple of friends who are dentists and I have a couple of friends who have gone through a considered decision about whether or not they continue to offer NHS-based industry or not. And the summary of it comes effectively, but by, by providing private care level dentistry, they're able to pretty much earn the same amount of money, but do about 50% less of the work. Um, it is down to the way that the NHS dentistry is funded. So it's based on something called UDAs, Units of Dental Activity. Um, and I'm not going to try and explain that because I'll probably get it wrong, to be honest. But effectively, uh, you know, the amount it costs to do a tooth removal compared to actually, you know, recovering the tooth properly in terms of the amount of work that, and the payment benefit that the mm. dentist would get is so at odds that it is better to just take out the tooth mm. um, from a cost effective point of view. And that's not great for a lot of dentists that want to offer effective care. So therefore, in order to offer, offer effective care, and to manage the business that they're still running on behalf of that, the better option is that they go private and then they actually have more time and capacity and sense. And interestingly, there is no requirement on a dental practice to have an NHS contract. That's mm -hmm. one of the key changes that happened several years ago. And that's one of the things that doesn't offer itself to general practice. Now you can absolutely run a private general practice service. That is possible. Obviously the fact that there is NHS general practice mitigates a lot of that for the population. Mm. So, you know, for me or you to suddenly turn around and say, well, we're going private, isn't really possible unless we're potentially willing to take a huge gamble on the livelihoods mm. of ourselves and our staff. And whether we would even have the number of patients willing to do that, mm. questionable as well. But that's handing back your contract. Dentistry is slightly different because you could always run parallel contracts in, mm. in terms of you could build a private list whilst you have an HS service and then transfer over when it felt it was no longer viable or sensible and stuff. So that's one of the key changes. From my understanding, and I forgot that wrong, I apologise, I'm happy to retract that if I have made the mistake, so I'm by no means an expert on this. But there are definite challenges here. So yes, readdressing the financing of how these contracts work will hopefully incentivize dentists to maintain their NHS-based mm -hmm. contracts and stuff. Um, they then for me, will hopefully be able to provide more of a capacity of service. Important to recognise as well, dentistry massively got cannibalised by COVID, mm. uh, probably a lot more than general practice in some ways, because the procedures they were doing were considered AGP procedures, aerosol generating mm. procedures. So actually the way that they could do a lot of dentistry wasn't possible during the peak and majority of COVID. General practice was less affected in that mm. particular aspect of stuff because we were still able to see patients face to face with what was recognized as manageable PPE, although it initially wasn't provided effectively. Whereas dentists had to wear the full yeah. space suits and stuff like they had to do in ITUs and that kind of thing. That massively impacts the type of care you can yeah. offer, really. They can't do a great deal on the telephone either. Can exactly. They? As we were there is a limit to what you can do for dentistry on the, on the telephone compared to what you can do as a well-trained GP um, uh, healthcare mm. service in primary care. So I think some of this is going to be a positive stuff. They have whether this is a general so it goes down a little bit lower so it says about supporting the dental workforce um so they are looking at enhancing the other roles in dentistry mm. moving away from the dentist now we've seen this in general practice it has not gone amazingly well as it could have done i think mm. so um it will come down to again the devils in the detail and that kind of stuff but obviously having more dental assistance having more hygienists and stuff may help with access and preventative care in particular in some parts but obviously how will that help with acute care hopefully we'll have yeah. some benefit 
Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Also looking to bring some dentists in from overseas. I think they're talking about changes to the uh, the registration process yep. with the General Dental Council to allow more overseas dentists into yep. the country. So just in, in, interesting to acknowledge mm -hmm. uh, that aspect uh, of it. And there was also they're bringing uh, giving an increased role to integrated care boards uh, to be accountable for the bridge provision mm -hmm. of dentistry in their area as well. The part I'm concerned that isn't included is this is what measures are they putting in place to convince dentists who have gone private to come back to NHS dentistry? Because actually that's the bigger thing I think. Many dentists have already made that decision, they're going private, they've already done that, they've closed their NHS mm -hmm. contracts. How are they gonna convince those dentists to come back to deliver NHS-based dentistry, which is actually what they need to do? And I suspect that's something they're not gonna be able to do. Mm, it's gonna be difficult, isn't it? Yeah. It's almost like they're, they're maybe anticipating a different model of dentistry for the delivery of mm. NHS dentistry involving and the question is will the general roles? practice end up going down this route as well I've yeah. had a lot of I've been having conversations with colleagues about this and maybe it's a maybe it's a separate uh, mm. a separate chat but um, you I think what happened with um, with dentistry again it's not a topic I'm close to but it feels like there was almost a tipping point um, where um, it's right. If, if there's good enough, if, if enough people are providing good enough provision for an NHS service, mm. then there isn't a huge market for the private services or that private market is limited. Mm -hmm. There's a point where people shift from providing NHS service towards providing private service. And there's a tipping point somewhere in that process mm -hmm. where actually uh, the provision of NHS services becomes so bad that people who wouldn't necessarily have previously wanted to mm. or found the money to pay for private services begin to do that because the the access and the provision is so poor and people worry that mm. general practice could go through a similar process with I'll, I'll be honest we're going through that now i have several patients that you know i would not envisage have the funds and resources to pay for private care and they've told me even that they don't have those funds and resources but they are contemplating because of the fact that the wait is so long for them to be seen by secondary care because of the fact that they have not moved forward with their health challenges because of access in terms of um, diagnostics in terms of treatment in terms of outcomes and that kind of stuff so it is already happening and you're right i think we're getting very close to that tipping point the question then will be what happens and more importantly the cynic in me would say is that the design of some of the policy changes that we've seen recently as well let's let that float so before so, we talk about enabling delivery, which is the fine part, and I appreciate this is a very long episode that we've gone into. Yeah. I think me and Andy have probably got well Carried wedged in, in, into our discussion and stuff. We have had a couple of comments. So we had one earlier from Vig who was talking about no easy answers, as he says, the money is the answer. Everyone has a price, increased pay, remove punitive pension, deterrence, and hospital doctors and other vital hospital staff will work more to reduce wait times. Of course, there's no there money. is no money. And then Modal Diamond is then asking a question. How would you characterize investment policy in GPIT systems? What transformations are in place and what's coming? Um, we could probably do a whole episode mm. on this, to be honest. However, the key thing is, is that the big thing that we know is going to come through is the GPIT futures commissioning um, is due for renewal, I think, next year. Um, mm. And there are potentially new entrants into the market coming. And I think that is going to be game changing for general practice IT in particular. Um, however, we're not going to know more about that until the... the the next basically 2023 when this happens because until we know what the contracts look like and the expectations and stuff and what these new entrants are going to do it's yeah. going to be really interesting to see because there are some really exciting potential ones coming through and hopefully that will make our existing providers step up their game in yeah. particular in terms of what they're providing and um how that will work and stuff but wait and see i think is the best thing that we can say at this point um but there is definitely some cool stuff coming yeah I, that's all i would say as well i don't have any more to say on that so i agree enabling delivery is the final section of this document um and basically it summarizes i'm pretty lot. i'm pretty short and it's very <laughs> short yeah because there's no detail yeah. we've talked about this numerous times and um, so they're going to adhere to their manifesto commitments of six thousand gps i'm going to bash that in there and the yeah. that's one of their manifesto commitments okay good i'll believe that yeah. when i see it yeah that's what, um yeah. and stuff um and a national endeavor to basically make this stuff so this is where i think they are talking about the volunteering stuff. Uh, there is a couple of lines in there where well, I've lost track of where it is, but yeah. Mm, okay. Yeah. The, the national endeavor is, is repeated a few times, which has the sense of everyone pulling together. So mm -hmm. maybe they are thinking about using the volunteer workforce or mm -hmm. auxiliary um, staff, as we heard about in the, uh, the ambulance section. Um, 
but I guess we will support the health and social care system to deliver by incentivizing staff retention and return retired staff. So I guess there was some of the pension mm. issues there amongst other interventions. Um, and they state that um, keeping emergency registers of health professionals for two years or more. I, I, I'm not, I couldn't fully understand what that means. It's almost like when you're an army reservist and then they, and then they call the you reserves. back if there's a yeah. national, if it's, there's it's a the, war. It's the reserves. It's effectively that. So when you um, re remove yourself from the GMC yeah. list or the NMC list, you know, effectively they aren't meant to keep that data any longer yeah. because of GDPR and all that kind of stuff. They're saying, no, 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 we're, we're, hold fire. We're, we're going to keep your details just in case if you need it. I mean, it, it kind of helped during COVID. Yeah, you know, there was because, a return. Because to... you can contact people, yeah. I guess. You don't, you don't have to necessarily drag them out of their house no. and um and make them serve but mm -hmm. uh, yeah it then talks about recruiting more skilled workforce from abroad i would love to see them change some of the tier two qualification issues mm. that we're currently having with so you know in terms of retain i mean we've heard stories where gp trainees who have finished their gp training course have been told that they have to go back to their home countries after we've invested hundreds of thousands of pounds mm. in training these people but because of um legal reasons they're having to go back to their home host countries and stuff um and, and that just seems bonkers but also bringing well-trained people from abroad, actually that's sensible to do. Again, surprising to hear from the Tory government, but hey. Um, you know, Gandhi, I, I had some interesting conversations with international medical students mm -hmm. in in just over the last sort of six months, really, as they've been coming back into practice. And uh, previously, a few years ago, people were generally uh, overseas or, or you know, uh, from the UK, uh, medical students were normally overwhelmingly positive about the NHS. Mm -hmm. What I'm hearing more and more from the overseas students when I ask, what are your career plans? What do you think of doing in the future? I'm hearing much more, I intend to go back to my own yeah. country when I have my qualification. And the implications, they don't feel that the NHS treats staff I'm very aware two, well. Two of the people I'm um, training have told me exactly that. The moment they qualify, they're heading back. Yeah. And I've, I've, I've not heard that before. This is yeah. this is a new phenomenon. So um, I think in, we, we shouldn't take it for granted that the UK is automatically uh, a, an attractive place to work and that the NHS is automatically yeah. an attractive Especially place, organisation to work in. Yeah. Um, that's not necessarily going to be the case. You need to treat your staff well mm -hmm. and uh, have people believe that they will be treated well within the NHS if you actually want to attract and keep them. But mm -hmm. so that was an interesting point to add. Um, recruiting more people to work in care both mm -hmm. from the UK and internationally so similar uh, similar objectives and, and aims there which is good supporting new models of care new roles for frontline health professionals so this mm -hmm. again is the language of we're not necessarily going to focus on training more doctors no they are training more nurses um you know or or more dentists we're not talking about increasing mm -hmm. dentistry places uh, you know a university or dental school expansion um we're going to have different models and we're going to get people from overseas is what I'm hearing here, which feels a little sad, really, that we mm -hmm. don't feel that we can produce more of the professionals that people uh, need to see and want to see. Mm -hmm. uh, and it feels like that should be an aspiration uh, for the country if that's what needed. But but there we go. Um, and then supporting the NHS and social care to make the most digital technology. That goes without saying, yep. but but you you do need to make sure people know it's a priority so they can be focused on it funding can be applied to it. Um, and then they're going to, to look again at long-term workforce plans. So maybe this is where, to be fair, they anticipate saying more about workforce. I don't know, but they're just acknowledging uh, that they're going to review a few different things around workforce and training and education and so mm -hmm. forth. And that's the end of the document. So that, that felt like a bit of a mammoth episode, Gandhi. Yes, apologies for all of you. And yeah. we know we normally do shorter episodes than this, but as you can tell, we're quite passionate about some of the, the ways that this may have impact on general practice and in particular you know, in terms of care for our patients. Um, what do you think, Andy, in summarising? Do you think this is going to make a difference? Um, <laughs> I love... Um, I think we're going to be struggling with healthcare for a long time, and mm. I think I think the problems that we face as a country providing good quality healthcare that people have good access to in a timely fashion uh, is not that we don't have enough allied health professionals. Mm. Um, you know, it, it's it's not necessarily even that people can't see the data about underperformance. Is the, the underperformance is there mm. anyway? That shouldn't be there and it wasn't there in the past we didn't need to show people this data to let them choose you know the problem is that we don't spend enough on providing the workforce that's necessary yeah. and training people we don't spend enough on the services um 
And we are facing demographic challenges as a country that mean we will mm. probably have to spend more than we want to as a country on these things in the future. And, I, I, you know, I think until we come to grips with that, I think we'll be continuing to have conversations about the health service and social care not being in the place where people want it to be. So I don't think this is going to solve the problems. I think it'll probably it may help a little bit. It'll keep it'll make a lot of work for people in management positions while they try and reconfigure. But I just wonder if some of the if really we need simpler, mm. bolder solutions. And it's not necessarily that the structures that we have and we've been delivering care for for years, like the GP practice unit are, are wrong. It's just that we're we're not investing enough relative to the increasing needs that are happening. So if that was a bit of a ramble, Gandhi, but what do you think? Is this going to solve our problems? Absolutely not. Uh, I, I think it's a shot in the dark and it's more, more than anything. It's a headline grabber. It's a way of trying to change the narrative to focus more on the fact that general practice is not performing when it actually it is. It's a way of basically setting the tone so that hopefully then so other things will naturally happen as a result of it. Um, I am very clear from my perspective that you know this whole concept of the two week expectation is you know it's not realistic and um, trying to deliver that within our practices without the additional resources to help make that manageable it's just, it's just not going to happen I'm, I'm really sorry and for, for the patients in my practice i'm being very clear this is not something that we're going to be able to achieve with the current resources that we've been given if there is a plan for further resources that may help to man make that manageable but i know that every person in my practice is working themselves flat out you know i do probably 50 hours a week in practice um and you know patients are surprised that i'm still there at eight o'clock in the evening nine o'clock they evening. see our cars in the car park don't they yeah uh, and, i don't and, believe you know, the time that is the home. reality of general um, practice currently and you know the question of do we keep flogging ourselves to do better service for our patients unfortunately i think increasingly more and more clinicians get to the point where the altruism to the nhs ideals is becoming a challenge to still align yourself up to mm. and actually we need to protect ourselves in order to protect our patients so actually i think this is going to do more harm than good than what therese kofi was hoping yeah. for um there is absolutely very little substance to these plans in my view yeah. well when i when i saw uh when i first heard about these plans i saw Teresa kofi talking about um improving access to gp appointments on the on the TV, talking mm -hmm. about see your GP within two weeks and how you can see a, a pharmacist with your sore throat, um, you know, uh, as if that was something new. And, and I thought, oh, I see what's happening. Mm -hmm. So today and for this week, we're, we're not going to be talking about the cost of living crisis. We're not going to be talking about government no. debt. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to be talking about GP access again because it's, it's a it, distraction because it, it's something that resonates with the population and you know <laughs> it can be used to distract. Mm -hmm. Although we do need plans and we do need to do something uh but it was just interesting when it appeared in the news there cycle are absolutely slivers of positivity in this in some places and we've talked about them already but generally speaking the tone is uh, condemnation more than anything else is what i felt from reading yeah. this um i have not seen anything that's actually made me think this is going to make a noticeable difference to the care that our patients will receive but and as i mentioned it's distraction rather than anything yeah. else. But let us know if you're, you know, if you if you see things differently, or, or if you think that we've become too cynical. That's something I often mm. worry about um, as I get older. But um, but let us know if you agree with the with the plans, or um, if you have any other you know great ideas to solve the problems that we face in delivering good, accessible healthcare as a country. So maybe time to wrap up, Gandhi. Yeah, we're coming up to ninety minutes. We probably are one of our longest episodes we've ever done. Apologies on that, everyone. We our next one will be shorter. Our next one will actually be about. Uh, our Teresa Coffey, state, Teresa Coffey um, in terms of a, an introspective look at her career and her life and just giving you a little bit more information about her. We've done this for our previous Secretary of States for Health in our previous episodes. So we thought we'd do this for our next episode next week. And as ever, if you do have any comments or questions, let us know down in the comments below and catch us soon. S1F Bug 22 is coming yeah. soon. 11th of October, make sure you sign up. We've got some amazing things planned for that. And as ever, we're here to help tech enhance your primary care and learning. We'll catch you in the next episode.